Hi everybody, thanks for joining me for this week's question and answer video. It's Q&A Monday. Thank you for joining me. Uh, welcome new viewers, people who are new here to this. This is a question and answer video I'm doing every single week. I'm answering people's questions from last Monday. Go down below into the description box, ask me anything you want and I'll answer it next Monday in the next qu uh, question and answer video. Um, something I do every week is I make a recommendation for you guys. Something to help you guys recover, heal, grow, all these kinds of things. This week I'm recommending something fun that I hope that all of you will do. All of you. And that's vacation. Take a vacation. Okay? Take a vacation. Have something planned. I think this is, for so many different reasons, this is healthy. I, I just even looked up what are the scientific reasons to take vacations, why they're beneficial. It says stress reduction. That's you. Heart disease prevention. All of us. Improved productivity, that's a big one, huh? And better sleep, I didn't think about that one. Sometimes I don't get the best sleep on vacations, so that's weird, but maybe overall, all in all, having vacations in your life helps you sleep better. But what I wanna add is a couple of the most important reasons to take a vacation for you guys. If we've been traumatized, if we're depressed, things like this. Think of all the trauma and bad things that happened maybe in a relationship that you were in recently while you were living in your home, right? I mean, some of it had to happen in your home. Some of it was while you were on the phone in your home. Some of it was after you felt really bad, you're in your home, in your bed and sleep. And getting a whole new environment helps your brain. It really does. Your brain right now, if you've been traumatized and screwed over and you have loss and things like this, your brain is focusing on this big time and how to keep you safe. If you remove yourself completely from this environment and put yourself in a new one, now your brain starts looking for new fears and it kind of forgets that old stuff for a little while. It may come back when you go back home, but while you're on vacation, you get a little break off your brain. Isn't that nice? It starts looking around for new things and new dangers. And you know, it, it just, it helps give us a little break. I remember um, someone that was, really doing badly and I told them just get out get out of town and they were able to afford it and they're like just tell me where do I go David and I was sending them to a couple different places to vacation and really in a month they just felt so much better um, it is so good for you so good for you but the other thing is is it's a part of what you want it's a part of your plan it's something to look forward to in the future instead of just keep looking back behind you in the past it really helps with depression. It really helps us feel excited about something that's going to happen, something to look forward to. Okay, so take a vacation, guys. Whether that's a drive for the day, whether it's go down to the beach for a weekend, um, camping, something like this. The weather's still maybe permitted for some of you where you're at. Go see a relative, a friend, visit a friend is a great thing to do right now for you guys, okay? So take a vacation, have something planned. Even if you can't afford it, you can still plan it. Can't you? If you can't afford a vacation right now, it doesn't mean you can't take one in six months, right? So why can't you plan it? Have something in your want section of who you are, something to look forward to, okay? And then if you do something a little bit, you know, when you're feeling down, something for, towards your vacation, it helps you feel better. All right, guys, that is the recommendation for the week. Let's get into the questions. The first one's from Rory in Ohio. Hello, Rory. Happy Wednesday, David. Purging my closet today in more ways than one. It's causing me to reflect on apologies from the narcissist so very long ago. He always said it wasn't his intent to hurt me. Like that would erase whatever he had done. Absolve him from everything while never really apologizing. Fake apologies aimed at making him feel better, not alleviate any pain he had caused or to get him out of it so he could later repeat the process. Wash, dry, fold, repeat. Would you please talk about empty apologies and how their cycles of fake apologies are much like doing, and you have an emoji, I think that means laundry. Thanks in advance, David. Laundry is on spin cycle. Um, empty apologies, sure. Y you know, if, if someone doesn't believe what they're doing is wrong and they tell you sorry, you can tell, you can feel it, right? It's, what we need is, is emotional security. We need reassurance. And if somebody hurts you, we need to be reassured it will never happen again because if we're not, then we don't have emotional security and we know it's going to happen again and it feels bad. That's the whole point of relationship. Feelings. Feels bad. We want comfort. We want safety. We want security. Things like this. And when somebody hurts your feelings and just goes, oh, sorry, didn't mean to, it was your fault, these kinds of things. 
oh, I was drunk, I was, I was tired, you know, somebody else made me do it, you shouldn't have said that to me, you know. These things mean I'm going to do it again, period. And it, whether they're going to do it or not, what's important is how it feels. It feels bad, doesn't it, Rory? It feels awful when someone hurts your feelings and they don't sit there and reassure you that they'll never do it again, that they blame you, or, or even just the, sorry, sorry. Something that bothers me is when people talk to me, or send, especially in messages, and they never say, I. They never say, I love you, I am sorry, right? It's, love you, sorry. They can't even say, I'm. It's just not, doesn't feel genuine if you can't take an extra step to say an extra word. Yeah. And like I said, the, the point of relationships is to feel comfortable and we have emotional needs. And the point of those is to feel emotionally stable and good. And so most important may be security. And I've got to, I've got to feel secure that you're going to be with me, that you're going to stay with me, that you're not going to leave me, that you're not going to talk bad about me to other people. You're not going to share things that we hold in private with each other, that you're not going to hurt me again. We all make mistakes and we do hurt each other sometimes, but it's, it's a big difference, isn't it? If, if I hurt you one time, a new time, a new way, if I hurt you a new way and I say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. I'll never, ever do that again. And maybe take a step or a measure to show you how serious and committed I am to that. The, the cycle is the person hurting you doesn't believe it's wrong. He tells you what he needs to tell you so you don't leave. Then he does it again, right? Isn't that the cycle? I'm not sorry I do it again. I'm not sorry you know I'm going to do it again. You feel like I'm going to do it again. The problems in relationships that are emotional are emotional. They feel bad. It's not always um, they cheat on me and so I feel bad. It could be, well, I don't know if they cheat on me, but I don't feel secure that they're not. It, I can tell my wife, honey, I don't feel secure. I'm not necessarily saying I think you're cheating on me. I could know that my wife, I'm pretty sure, hey, wife, I know you're not cheating on me, but I just don't feel reassured that you love me or that I'm important to you, that this relationship you value a lot because you're working overtime and then you go out with your girlfriends, you know, and then you forgot my birthday. <laughs> it's like, well... Hope that makes sense. Thank you, Rory. Let me know what you think. Next question is from Juliana. And I don't know where you're from. If you guys can tell us your location, let us know where you're at. Thanks. I have CPTSD and I don't know how to function. My two modes are too apathetic to care about my responsibilities and then getting myself to a point where I'm motivated to be productive, fueled 100% by anxiety. I am prescribed stimulants and I have caffeine all morning because I, if I don't, I'll sleep or otherwise stay horizontal. <clears throat> so you've got, oh, you didn't say anything about sleep before that. Okay, but then I have to be medicated to cool down and go to bed. I've always had that delayed sleep phase disorder or something that naturally happens in teen years and then can become a pattern. If you're serious and you're committed, quit the caffeine. Just stop it. See what it's like. Can you do it for a day, a night, a week, a month? How long? How long is your sleep dependent on that or important to you? Because sleep is a primary need. Without it, you're dying. And anything you're going through right now, like CPTSD, sleep, most important, sleep you have some control over. What do I mean? Oh, David, you, I, you don't understand. I wake up, it takes me a while to go to sleep. Give yourself more time. Okay. With, with stress, we need nine hours of sleep. The problem is that people who have stress disorders, they don't get nine hours sleep. Not because they wake up, because they're not committed to themselves. Period. I can give you 40 different suggestions on how to get better sleep. You can look up my video called Sleep Hygiene in the Healing CPTSD playlist. But if I gave you 40 suggestions, how many of them would you take? Two? One of them is go to bed earlier. The hardest. Go to bed earlier. If I need nine hours of sleep, it won't do me much good to go to bed at midnight if I have to get up at nine if I wake up. And I wake up and I wake up and it's hard for me to fall asleep and it's hard for me to go back to bed. And because the second I wake up, I already have enough. I don't, I already don't have enough sleep and it's already stressing me out, which makes me stay up longer. So if I know I get up for an hour, then I go to sleep at 11. If I have to get up at nine, that gives me 10 hours. It gives me one hour to wake up and be up stress-free, go back to sleep. 
we've got to start taking care of ourselves and we have to be totally committed. Sleep is so vitally important. So vitally important. It's the only time your brain is truly healing from the damage that trauma has caused it. Um, and if we're taking caffeine during the day and taking sleep aids at night, that, that's so counterproductive. Caffeine can stay in your body up to 15 hours. So, right? I mean, if I'm, if you get up at nine or eight, say you get up at eight and you have a cup of coffee at nine and you have another cup of coffee at 10, then what is that? 10, 10 in the morning, then you go 10 at night and then 11, 12, one, two. So it's in your, it's in your body till about two in the morning. And if you have a sleep, if you have a stress disorder and you might have a sleep disorder, I would say zero caffeine, not just a little is okay. Don't need it. There's other alternatives to help your blood vessels open up, arteries open up and start thinking and stuff better. I have, um, you know, when you see a professional, I have so many recommendations of natural remedies and things that you could be doing and taking, but it takes commitment. Um, your, the rest of your question. Uh, da, 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 da. I've always had that delayed sleep phase disorder or something that naturally happens in teen years and then can become a, a pattern. Well, no, you're suffering from a stress disorder. So you have stress chemicals flowing through your body, like adrenaline <laughs> when you're trying to go to bed. That's why. Uh, I'm in therapy already, but I just feel like I need an intensive program because relationships with narcissists and antisocial personality disorder have seeped into every part of my life and destabilized me from my core as they've become a consistent presence in my life. How do I change the way I function? Get better help. If, if the help that you have isn't working, then get better help because that's common. That happens. That happens with everything out there from doctors to lawyers, right? Get better help. Mechanics, all of it. I had a mechanic I used to take my car to and say, hey, I think this is the problem. And he'd fix that problem and the problem wouldn't be fixed. And I'd say, well, the problem's not fixed. He goes, oh, you said uh, you, you think it was this. So I don't know. I wasn't telling you to replace this. I said, I think it's this. I guess I won't say anything next time, you know, and they don't fix the problem. And yeah. So we go somewhere else. Okay. So, um, you know, CPTSD is an umbrella term for many, many other problems and symptoms and disorders. We could have sleep disorders, addiction disorders, eating disorders, mood disorders, anger disorders, depression disorders, anxiety disorders. I mean, there's just so many other problems that CPTSD has and it all falls under that. And we've got to start fixing all of these one by one. And so if you're just in talk therapy and they're not telling you how to have better sleep, then they must not know. So we go somewhere else, okay? I attack all these things in people's lives. We get all of them better from eating and sleeping and working out and all of our relationships. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the best advice. Get better help. Unless you just started seeing this person and maybe you haven't given them a chance yet, but, but go tell them all these problems and ask them what they think you should do. And if they don't have a plan to fix it, they're not gonna for you. And you need to fix it. You're the one that fixes it. They just tell you how. I know how to fix a lot of these problems. You just have to be committed and do it. I hope I helped you. you. You're asking me such a loaded question. How do I function properly with CPTSD? Well, we get professional help and it could take months. It could take years. You know, it's not something I could just answer in a, in a, in a sentence or two. Okay. Thank you. Get the help that you need. Okay. If that's not the help that you need, give them a chance. If you just started, let them know what your problems are and then ask them how they plan on helping you fix them. I'm sorry if you, if you wanted better answers. That's the true answer though. You guys, the, the C in the CPTSD stands for complex. It's not easy doing this or fixing this and it's not easy even finding a professional that knows how. So there's no easy quick fix and doing so could make you more can cause more damage. Okay. Traveling man from Louisiana. Hello. After being in a long-term relationship with a borderline, how will one know they are ready to be vulnerable again? It's been six months now. And although I've been casually seeing someone, I feel like I psych myself out, shut down any soft moments. Part of me wants to give in. Part of me wants to continue to be emotionally closed off. I guess I'm confused, conflicted. I wonder if there's more I need to process. And so 
Uh, how do you know you're ready to date again or be vulnerable again? Let's heal from our past relationships. And that means when I think about them, when I talk about them, people bring them up. I check my emotions and how do I react to them? Do I still feel the trauma? Do I still feel upset, scared, depressed, right? Then maybe I'm not ready yet until my until my experiences are okay. With, I'm okay with it. I, I've healed from it. I don't get emotional responses and reactions from it anymore. That's one way, okay? But... You know, I've made videos recently about being uh, unlovable in times of our life. And there's different things that cause this. And one is being scorned, right? Being traumatized, bad experiences, so bad. I'm not ready to love again. I'm not ready to be vulnerable. I'm still having troubles loving myself. I don't know if that I can trust somebody. I don't know if I can love somebody. I don't know if I can give a relationship everything that it consists of and requires to be functioning and loving and healthy. And Right? So maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're not ready. And only you can answer that, and that's a tough one, okay? And, and I can't think of a better time to talk to somebody else about this, and not just your partner. Step out of this relationship, talk about this with someone that you can trust, and maybe you can arrive at a conclusion on what you think is the best for you right now. And if it's not being, if you can't commit to this relationship, it's not fair to the other person. And you just simply say, I'm just ready. I guess I'm not ready to commit yet. This is an emotional thing. It's not something I have control over and can just say, screw my emotions and just do it anyway. I can't give you what this relationship requires and what you need. I can't meet your needs right now. I need to love myself a little more before I'm ready to be with you. I'm not asking you to wait for me. I understand. But when I'm ready, I'm going to come running to you. I don't know tough choice to make and that's why it's so important that we're aware of the commitments that we make there's nothing casual about it there's nothing casual about adding people to our lives in, in committed relationships don't treat it as such it's extremely important who we allow into our life and if we have had problems doing this Let's fix those problems first. I hope I answered your question. Good luck with your relationship, okay? It's just something that you're going to have to answer for yourself if you're ready or not. And you can get help with that by talking to people, okay? Talk to your friends and stuff too. Um, Liana Elena Bord Borduno. And I'm sorry if I messed that one up. Uh, bless you. Thank you, for all, thank you for your dedication. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for telling me. Thank you. Emily Merton from South Africa. Hi, Emily. Isn't it better that they are narcissists rather than just being half toxic and good at other times? We can say they did it because they have this disorder. But what about other people who hurt you? Well, Emily, the labels, the titles, the disorders, why do they even matter? We can have compassion for everybody hurting. We can have compassion for everybody that's not healed. We can have compassion for everybody that hurts other people. Anyone, you know, I can really understand why people hurt people, even when it happens to me. Then I can have compassion for them. But it doesn't really matter what their reasons are, does it? I said, I wrote here, I think most everyone can detest to a good time or two with the abuser. Labels don't really matter. It is not okay for anyone to hurt you and everyone must be held accountable. It's not okay for our spouse. If our spouse hurts us, just like it's not okay for the mailman to be mean or rude or hurtful. We accept all of them for who they are and decide if we want to keep them in our lives. And if we do, then communication is vital. Okay. It doesn't matter what their titles are. It doesn't matter what their reasons are. People seem to hold tight to their reasons why they hurt people. It doesn't really matter. Mayday 522. Hello. Question. Is the addiction to alcohol, drugs, dating sites, etc. to regulate the rage, escape the reality, silence the conscience, or all the above? I observe the longer the addictions wore on him, the faster the cycles of breakdowns occur. He could go six months well, then break down. Then it was 90 days. Then every couple of weeks, sometimes all in one week, I ended it for good, realizing there was no hope and no point. The alcohol addiction long-term becomes a beast no one wants to reckon with, even the alcoholic. Alcoholism is just disgusting. Oh my gosh. Alcohol is so bad, it's straight poison. 
and to be addicted to that, where your body will die if you cut yourself off of it. Oh, man. And, and the behavioral and personalities of alcoholics are just nasty, aren't they? Alcoholics and, and methamphetamine uh, addicts are just some of the worst. Gosh, ugh. Um, so your question, yeah, sure, all the above. It, it, the real one is conscience. Conscience is uh, uh, awareness of myself, of who I am, and they're trying to drown that, aren't they? They don't want to feel it. They don't want to look at themselves. They don't want to process their pain, their troubles, and look at it and face it, okay? Um, the, the cycles are because addictions are to external things. And you can look at anything external and it fades. It doesn't last. Beauty doesn't last. Drugs don't last. You get high and you go down and you get high and you go down. And soon of any external factor, whether it's a relationship with a narcissist, whether it's gambling or sex or even work, it, it serves its purpose. And then there's a downtime and an up and a down and an up and a down. And we get addicted to this. Um, this hormonal cycle, but um, it's never enough. The highs are never enough and the lowers just get lower. It's external. That's why you guys are never enough for a narcissist because a narcissist is dependent on you. And you're, that, because that means you are external. They don't take care of themselves. It's as simple as, I don't know how to reassure myself. I can't reassure myself and tell myself I'll be okay. I need somebody to do that for me. I need someone to reassure me, reassure me, tell me I'll be okay. And once you do it, whether it works or not, you're going to have to do it again and again. And because I need to reassure myself. And that lasts a long time, forever. But once I can't reassure myself, I'm dependent on something from the alcohol, get me drunk. And then, okay, that feels good for a while. And then when the alcohol goes away, now I feel even worse. Okay, get me high. Okay, let's do a line of cocaine. And let's, you know, okay, let's, let's have sex. That gets my mind off it. And I'm trying to not be aware of how I feel. Just what you said. Thank you. Oh, and let me know where you're from, you guys. Uh, Big Dave from Tennessee here. Hello, Big Dave. I've been posting some things. Oh, yeah, you're talking about some of my some of the questions disappear. I'm sorry. If that ever happens, guys, please keep uh, posting them. You, Dave asks, is it wrong? Oh, wait. Let's start before that. The sentence before that. You asked on your video, what do we want or expect? From closure is it wrong that to want to be able to just say what we need to say say what we wished we could have said but we're not allowed at the time and maybe the deeper darker part also just to see those dead eyes looking back with no explanation dave no of course it's not wrong we need it we need closure and we've asked a couple of questions about closure and i hope i've answered them for you it's not wrong how could it be wrong to want to say something to them, you know, and you said because you weren't allowed to or whatever, but it's because they don't care. They don't care how you feel. They don't care what you want. They don't care what you need. They don't care what you value. They don't care about your opinion. And that's who you are. And you want to express yourself. We need closure at the end of a relationship. A failed relationship is one of the worst experiences of our life, period. Two bad experiences. We lose someone we care about or the relationship ends, meaning they die or they leave one way or another, we, whether we end it or not. It's the worst experiences of our life and we need explanations and understanding. And if I love you and you love me, why can't we just say something about how it ends? To go and be, date someone else and create a narrative, you're a bad, horrible person. I mean, God, it just ruins the psyche without knowing why we're hurting, we internalize it as shame. I'm hurting because I'm a bad person. I feel guilty because I didn't make it work because they aren't taking any accountability. Then I'm left feeling guilty. I was treated badly and I'm hurting because I'm just a bad person. I'm not worthy of anything better or anything more or anything I want. It's an awful experience, Dave. And, and the one thing we can give ourselves and another person that we've spent our lives with and our time with is the truth. We need the truth. It doesn't help. It doesn't help at all when someone tells me I'm leaving you because um, it's just because of me. 
I don't, I don't know what's going on. It's just, you know, I just need more. And I just, you know, sitting there just BSing me when there's another person, another man. Tell me there's another man. Tell me you don't love me anymore. Tell me you're not attracted to me anymore. Tell me you can't stand the way I do something. And you thought you could and you thought you could put up with it, but you can't do it anymore. And I'm sorry and goodbye. <sighs> it helps. It helps us and it, and it helps with... Um, Accepting that it's over. You know, I'm lovable again. Somebody will put up with me eating with my mouth open, if that's what it is, you know, or I'll learn to eat with my mouth closed, I guess. Thanks, Dave. I hope I answered your question. Let me know. Victoria from the Bay Area again. Hi, Victoria. I was watching Kim Wilson's TV old videos. She mentioned that narcissistic people are basically bullies. What are your thoughts? Are they basically just bullies with skills? And if they are, just bullies. Should we stand up to them by not acknowledging their presence? Absolutely. <clears throat> Part of manipulation really is just kind of bullying. You don't want to do it. I want you to do it. I'm going to try to get you to do it. And I can lure you in with money and sex and looks and whatever I want. But when it comes down to it and you won't do it, I'm going to bully you. Well, you should just do it. Well, why do you just do it? I did it for you. You just do it for me. Oh, everybody else is doing it. Blah, 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 blah. They're just bullies. Total bullies. And should we stand up to them? I think everyone in the world should stand up to these bullies. Yeah. But we got to stay safe first. I mean, just don't ever forget safety first, right? The problem is, is in society, it can be very difficult to stand up to bullies for many different reasons. I've been bullied for years, but I'm a man being bullied by a woman. And if I stand up to myself in public, because that's the only way I can do it, then everybody will hate me and say I'm a bad man. How dare you? say that to a woman that's who cares what the woman's doing to you and that's just one example where we can get in trouble standing up for ourselves um but safety first stay safe you know um bad behaviors in society can't be tolerated and if they're not tolerated they're not accepted they stop it's that simple so bad behaviors that you see people are doing they believe it's okay they're they don't have a problem with it and they don't think you do I've been stalked, cyber stalked for six years now. And there's a very sick, sick woman that makes videos about me for five years. She thinks it's okay. She doesn't know how sick she looks. She thinks her behaviors are totally fine. She's fine with them. And because nobody says anything to her, she thinks that they're accepted in society on YouTube because nobody says anything to her. Nobody goes over there and says, hey, that's pretty bad that you do this to this man. That's not right. Don't do it. So she thinks it's okay. Imagine if a hundred people stood up to her and said, you're gross, stop doing this. Maybe she would, right? But all bad behaviors are accepted. That's why they continue. If you're seeing bad behaviors, it's because they believe that they're accepted. <clears throat> Salema from France. Hi, Salema. I did the Myers, Meyer Briggs test online, a free test. I do not fully recognize myself with the result. Do you think that these free online tests are accurate? Or with the coaching, I am changing. And so it was not the proper time to do a personality test. Maybe it is better to do one before the coaching starts and one at the end. What do you think? That, I think that's a good idea. You know, Salema, uh, we don't self-diagnose ourselves and stuff like this. These, these tests online, they may not be accurate, especially doing them ourselves. Myers-Briggs test is a great personality test. I really like them. I think they're neat. Um, if you guys haven't done them, I encourage you to go give it a shot. It doesn't take very long. You can do it online. Sometimes you can find it for free. And it's like 30, 50 questions, and it helps you find your personality type based on four components. Um, but let me tell you, it, uh, these tests aren't allowed to be administered to people with personality disorders. Just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here. If your personality is this unstable, they're not ever going to be accurate. So when people, I, I've heard, I've had people literally diagnose with personality disorders. They don't know who they are at all from one moment to the next. And then they tell me, I did a Myers-Briggs test, David. I'm this, I'm that. It's like, yeah, well, that means nothing. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're so unstable. And, and literally, I, I, I knew someone that gave Myers-Briggs test, Myers test to people in companies and corporations. And if you're that unstable, they just don't even do them and you're not supposed to and they don't work. If we're coming out of a huge, crazy relationship, we might be really unstable right now and they may not be accurate either. So uh, if you wanted the most accurate test, Salema, maybe it'd be a professional that gives one at a time that you feel a little bit more stable in your life. I don't know. I don't know. But also look into it and, and try to understand what your results were so that you 
can really see if they're accurate or not. But um, if you're changing a lot right now, if your life is changing a lot right now, that personality test might be different soon. Uh, bear promise. How does someone build self-esteem as an adult? It's not easy, okay? And there's all kinds of things you can be doing. A lot of it has to do with how we build up confidence and self-worth. And so we take care of ourselves and give ourselves everything that we want and need. It raises our self-worth and it helps our self-esteem. We need confidence. Confidence comes from experience. Most people with low self-esteem haven't had very good positive experiences. They don't have much confidence either to try. So we try to do things and we try to have some positive experiences. And when we do, things get better for us, okay? But we really take care of ourselves and give ourselves everything we need and want. And here, here's some best advice for self-esteem is do things that you're good at, okay? And try and accomplish or be successful as something you're not very good at. If you can do those things, those really make a big, big impact impact on how we see ourselves and how we believe the world and the universe sees us. So meet your emotional needs, be physically healthy, have relationships with people that are healthy, feel so, so good. And then do what you're good at. If you're good at cooking, be better and better and better at it and throw a, a party, a dinner party and cook for people. And they'll tell you how good it was. Maybe there's five things that you're not very good at. Maybe you could try one of these things and try and be good at it and accomplish it and say, I, I'm pretty decent at this, something I'm not even good at. Positive experiences is what really helps, okay? And that's why typically low self-esteem is it at early stages of our life, but pre-experience, okay? Thank you. And Emily from South Africa says, I find it difficult to completely turn off and relax. What are more ways that I can do? What are more ways? And I think you think, what are things I can do to fix this? Um, I wrote two real simple things down that are huge. Raise your heart rate every day and meditate. Raise your heart rate and meditate. Um, there's many different factors, you know, like the person that's taking caffeine and then taking sleep medicine. That's not going to help you. Um, because the sleep medicine is brutal for one and, and caffeine is too. Caffeine's keeping you awake. Sleep medicine's making you groggy. Um, completely turn off and relax. I, I always suggest a, a kind of period before you go to bed to do this. And so we write down notes, what we need to do the next day. And then we put it away and we don't think about it anymore. And then we turn off all the exterior um, things that, that are too sensitizing, like uh, turn off the news and stuff like this and um, get, get a light, the same light, you know, color light, a green light or a pink light, something like that that comes on. You put that on every day when you're time, it's time to like relax and meditate and you get some peaceful music, the same music and you, and you get some, maybe some other watering sounds, you know, a little fountain and you get some nice smells that relax you. So there are lights, sounds and smells that help relax you. There's also natural things that you can take that I recommend. There's all kinds of things. There's, I mean, smells alone. There's so many different smells that help relax you. But this starts telling your body and your brain, most of all, it's time to relax. It's time to go to sleep. And your body and your brain should start shutting down. I don't know at what time that you want this to happen. If this is in the middle of the day or in the morning, typically it's at night when we need this. And I hope that helps. Raise your heart rate. We've got to process all these chemicals out of our body, okay? You can't just sit still. That causes anxiety. So move and raise your heart rate, not too much and meditate. That's it. Thanks. And that's all the questions, guys. Thank you very, very much. Um, today's video is a little late today. I got a late start on it. I'm, I'm sorry. Thanks for watching it. And uh, if you feel like it, I would really appreciate it for you. If you could subscribe to the channel, vote on it, share it, comment down below, ask questions. And always love yourself first. Thank you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.